We're going we're gonna to go to the cross. And um, in Isaiah 53, it says that, it says, uh, it's about the suffering servant. And it says, Who has believed our message? In whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? You know, what has He done? The arm of the Lord. I mean, you really think about the words that are being said. You know, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? You know, this outstretched arm it's talking about. You know, for He grew up before Him like a tender shoot. <coughs> and like a root out of parched ground. This is talking about Israel. This is talking about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It's talking about Him being a seed planted. It's talking about what He's about to go through for you and me. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon Him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to Him. He was despised and forsaken of men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That's Jesus. Amen. He knew what it was like to suffer. He knew what grief was. He didn't, you know, he said, I don't have a house to live in. You know, when he became a man, he left. Right? And like one from whom men hide their face, you know, they hid their face. They'd see Jesus. They'd go walk the other way. So there wasn't nothing there to, for you and me to be drawn to from an outward, fleshly desire or position. You know, to long for Him in any kind of way, shape, or form. Because that isn't what God wanted us to look to. It was, it was what was on the inside. And like one from whom men would hide their face, He was despised. And we did not esteem Him. Surely our griefs He Himself bore. You're going to find out what that's really all about. And our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. What we deserved, He took. And we're going to find out about that. And by His scourging, we are healed. Amen. It's talking about our salvation. That we can be healed from the sin that's within us. If we believe. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Amen. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb he was led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, led away, brought to the cross. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? This is a prophecy coming forth of how our Messiah was going to suffer. For the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due, the beating, the scourging, it was due unto us and them. But he said he'd take it. His grave was assigned with wicked men. Wow. Yet he was with a rich man in his death. He was esteemed as a transgressor. Looked at as a transgressor. That's why he was nailed between two thieves. Died as a transgressor, but buried in a rich man's tomb. Wow. Go figure. 
He's lucky he just wasn't cast out and thrown into, you know, wherever. Like these other two thieves. We don't know where they were buried. Yet he was buried in a rich man's, uh, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him. The Lord was pleased to crush him. Think about that one. Putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, a sin offering, a trespass offering, no, Lord, I'm going to render myself as the guilty one. I'm going to take that guilt. He was our guilt offering. Wow. He will see his offspring. That seed's got to be planted in order to see the offspring. If a seed isn't planting, it's no good. Right? Amen. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of his anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. But his knowledge... The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. That's us. It's you and me. We're justified by him being our guilt offering. Why? Because we're all guilty under the law. There's none righteous. No, not one. Not one. As he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. And he will divide the booty with the strong. Man, that's our promise that what he has is ours. Goes back to this. See this right here, this coffin? This is the first thing when the Lord called me in the ministry. I had to divide the booty. The treasure. Instead of gathering it for myself, he said, no, share it. And let them choose first. Take what you want. Because he poured himself out to death. And he was numbered with a transgressor. Don't you know that you and I, we will be numbered yeah. as transgressors of the law. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. That's him on a cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. The cross. I want to take you to the cross. I'm going to show you something the Lord absolutely just blew me away by. I told you guys Wednesday that I had something I wanted to share with y'all that was going to be, you know, new revelation, you know. And all I can tell you is wow. And it all came from a phone call. Um, before I share it with you, I want you to realize something. I'm going to read something to you. The true purpose of the ecclesia, the called out ones, this is your call to do and what I've been called to do. So now we can see the purpose of the church. I don't even like to say church, it's okay, because you are the church. This is your purpose. This is your purpose. You know, John and I, um, this past week we, was at a, we went to look at a job. It took us a long time to get to and try to find it. We couldn't, man, it was going crazy because I lost my phone and he left his home. It was crazy. You know, we driving all over the place looking for a building that had burned. You know, and so... 
We looked all over the place. It's on 11th Street in Gretna. All we can find is, is 8 and 9. There ain't no 10 or 11 or any other one. So we're driving past uh, this little building and it, the fire engine truck's lights on. I'm like, John, pull in right here. Surely they'll know where they had a fire. So anyway, long story short, they tell us where it's at. He pulls it up on a computer and we go to this place. We looked at what we had to do or what they wanted us, this job they wanted us to look at and do and the owner comes in. Well, before I walked in, when I walked in the door of this place, there was a shofar that was in the office up on top. And you know, one of the first things I do when I, I walk in some place is I look to see if Jesus is there. Yeah. And I saw the shofar and I'm like, you know what? You know, so I turned around and I looked back where I came in. I'm looking all in that office for something else that would show me that Christians are here. You know, because you could see a shofar and it doesn't mean anything. Or you could see one little picture up and it really doesn't mean anything because people put. But I turned and looked at the door and there was a scripture on the door. There was a scripture on the wall. I'm like, surely I'm, a, I'm in a place where these people love the Lord. We're getting ready to leave and the owner of the company is 68 years old. 68? 78. One of the two. 78 years old. Been serving the Lord for 47 years. He walks in and he's got a smile on his face. And you know what he says to us? He says, first question out of his mouth was, have you told anybody about Jesus today? I'm like, and I'm like, I told John, I said, man, I knew. I said, I knew this was a place where the Lord resided. I said, look at the shofar up on top. I didn't tell him. I said, look at the scriptures. And this man just began to, he said, man, I'm in love with a man. And started, I mean, just tearing up. His passion for Jesus was amazing. John was floored. And this man started talking about how important it is to fellowship with Jesus in His Word. And John just kept looking at me because he was just giving the same message I give all the time. It got so, he got to talking so much, I just let him share. He brought us in the office and started sharing with us in there about, you know, and brought us to a scripture in Romans 10 about the Lord. And he said, man, did I tell you that I'm in love with him? John said, man, it, you don't have to say it. It's all over you. <laughs> you know? And... Have you told somebody about Jesus today? It was, it was like, your life and my life is about that. That's what it's about. And this is where this came from. Um, after talking to John about the importance of, we were just talking about on the way up to the job, you know, I was telling him how when we go into different places, I'm looking for Jesus no matter wherever I go. I'm looking for him or looking for an opportunity that I can minister or share. Looking for an open door. I said, John, we just talked about this Wednesday night in church. You know, at the end of service, we was talking about ministry and sharing about Christ, you know. So here, let me tell you and show you the true purpose of the church. Your true purpose in life. The called out ones. The ultimate purpose of the church is to bring honor and glory to its head. Jesus Christ. Amen. It does this as it fulfills two purposes related to God's program for the world. He has a program for you and me. Remember, this is the true purpose of the ecclesia Anyone who feels like they've been called out by God. And if you're part of the body, that's you. This is your purpose. There are two purposes related to God's program for the world. The first purpose of the church, the called out ones, as it relates to the world, is evangelism. Have you told someone about Jesus? This program is spelled out in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, which has never been rescinded. The program is to teach all nations, and the way this is done is twofold. Number one, by baptism or by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Question, 
Was the thief on the cross baptized? <coughs> Question. Was the thief on the cross baptized? Yes, he was. This means, baptism, this means to immerse them or plant them in the fundamentals and the teachings of God's holy word. That's your job and my job. The second is by teaching them to observe all things whatsoever Christ has commanded us. Baptism is not, an ap is not an optional afterthought. It is a vital part of evangelism and in making disciples. By baptism, one indicates that he has been identified with Christ in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection, and has become a part of the universal church or the called out ones, the body in which Christ now resides. Amen. Also, the new true believer will now want to be identified with a local church or a fellowship of believers, the called out ones. A responsible, a responsible parent not only brings a child into the world, but also provides what is necessary for the child's growth. So, in the church, in the ecclesia, in the called out ones, you and me, teaching must accompany evangelism. What good is it if you're taught, 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 and you don't do anything with it? What good is the seeds that are given to you you don't plant? So that the child of God can learn all that God expects of him and has provided for him. Listen, it's not a would you or could you it's you are required by God to spread the word to sow seed and before that can happen you yourself must be planted that means you have to die my whole message today is was the thief on the cross baptized seeing through the eyes of a thief open your Bibles and let's go to Luke chapter 23 and we're going to read verse 33 through 43 I might pick up a little bit before that if you don't have a Bible we have plenty on the shelf over here Luke chapter 23. I want you to see it. Luke chapter 23. We're going to start actually in verse 26. And we're going to read into it. Man. We're going to start in... Uh, verse uh, chapter 23 verse 26 I want to go into it before I, I hit into the crucifixion Simon bears the cross remember Simon's name means hearing and let's read y'all ready Luke 23 verse 26 when they led him away they seized the man Simon of Cyrene coming from the country and placed him and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And remember, I told you guys, I taught about Simon the Cyrene. He was compelled, a man of hearing, his name means hearing, was compelled to carry the cross. That's you and me. That's what we need to be compelled to do. His sons was uh, uh, Simon, the son of um, Alexander and Rufus. Alexander... Rufus, um, Alexander was um, um, a Christian from Rome, and Rufus means red-haired. 
So a red-haired Christian from Rome was compelled, a man of hearing was compelled to carry the cross. That's what you and I should be doing every day. Taking people to the cross, right? In verse 27, And following him was a large crowd of people, and of the women were, they were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, Stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that have never bore and the breasts that have never nursed. Amen. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and the hills to cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Jesus was speaking of right here, that it's during a time when, you know, he's there. Life is, is being given to him. But there's coming a time, he's talking about when Rome, when Rome is going to sack Israel and destroy it. And you're going to be lamenting and mourning because they're going to kill everybody. You understand? Two others also. Now listen, here's where the message comes in. Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. So not only is Jesus coming down the road, but there's two criminals with him. So whatever's being said, these two criminals are hearing it. You understand? Meaning, these two criminals just heard what Jesus had said. Let's go on. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. We lost the battery, and uh, so I'm back up. Um, I'm going to back up to verse 33. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and one on the, uh, and one on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The thieves are hearing this. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine. 
and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him. This is the king of the Jews. Now listen, two thieves are on the cross. They're hearing everything that's being said. If you be God, if you are Christ, if you are the Son of God, the Chosen, the Holy One, save yourself. One thief then sees, or both thieves then see, them nail an inscription above the head or on the cross. It says, this is the King of the Jews. Remember, these two criminals, thieves that are hanging on side of Christ are Jews. They know a Messiah is supposed to come. One thief is enthralled at what he's seeing. Thinking to himself, could this be the one? While the other thief on the other side is saying in the next verse, save yourself and us. Save yourself and us. Saving self will never get it. Let's keep reading. Now, verse 38, there was an inscription above him. This is the king of the Jews. Written in three languages, it is established. You think it's by coincidence they did it in three languages? I think one of the thieves on the cross is like, he is. One of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us! But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God? There's a revelation here! There is a revelation that this thief just made a connection that this is God hanging on the cross. Amen. Wow! But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? to be condemned to death and you're hurling they raised Jews they know God even on your deathbed you're about to die you're railing out accusations do you not fear God man and we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds but this man has done nothing and he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He realized he was a king. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. One thief went to paradise and one thief went to hell. Was the thief on the cross baptized? My brother this week had called me up, and this is when the Lord had spoke to me. He told me about he was ministering to somebody, and a guy had asked him a question about, well, you know, do you have to be baptized to be saved? Do you believe that? Or, you know, what do you believe about that? You know? And he had given him, you know, a little explanation. And he said, well, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. And he went to heaven. Because Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, he said was the thief 
on the cross baptized. Yeah. Well, what is baptism? Baptism in itself is actually taking part in, it's a symbolic meaning of taking part in being dead and being buried in a ground and raising up. We do it symbolically by being baptized or being immersed in water we're taking part in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But baptized literally means to be immersed or to be planted. Was the thief on the cross baptized? Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Son! <laughs> I've heard it said, well, if you want to be if you don't want to be baptized, get on the cross. <laughs> he was baptized. Yes, he was. Let's look at it close. Let's see. The Bible, the Great Commission, is to go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. What is the gospel? The good news that Jesus Christ died and rose again. That we don't have to suffer for our sins. That one was bruised and stricken on our behalf. We're all sinners condemned to die under the law. But one that was perfect and just and holy took it upon himself. And it pleased God to crush him because if he's planted, he was going to bring forth a multitude. Amen. And Jesus Christ knew it. And if you plant yourself, you too will bring forth a multitude. But it won't happen until you die. Was the thief on the cross baptized? Verse 32 says, They were led with Him. They were with Him. To the place of a skull. Or where there was a buried head. Golgotha. And that's where our head was buried. In a nearby tomb. Right? This is where our head would die. And would be buried in a nearby rich man's tomb. Labeled as a transgressor of the law, but buried in royalty, verse 17 says, it was, in verse 17, in verse 17, it was called the Feast of Release. It was according to that custom that on this day, that one would be released. <laughs> it's where our release came in. He died on the feast of release. <laughs> Have you been released from the yoke of bondage and sin? Because it says, when he died, he went down and released the prisoners <laughs> that were held captive. The feast of release. In verse 34, Jesus says openly, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing. You know? Can you imagine being a thief on the cross and hearing this man next to him? They done tore all his hide off. He's unrecognizable as a human. This thief on the right is hearing him speak to his father saying, forgive them. Believe me. He realizes that this is no ordinary man. He's seeing it. His eyes are being opened to it. 
He's hearing the gospel. Watch. One of the thieves was so impacted by his love and his mercy while realizing that Christ even, that Christ even, one of the thieves was so impacted by his love and mercy while realizing that Christ even was forgiving them, asking that their sins would be forgiven for the ones that was actually crucifying him. He then, he then, I believe, this is me, comes to the conclusion that he too could be forgiven. If he is seeing a man, they have ripped him and tore him apart and nailed him on the cross, and he is asking God the Father to forgive them, he's like, maybe I could be forgiven. There's a realization that's happening right now. He then believes and comes to the conclusion that he too can be forgiven. I ask again, was a thief on the cross baptized? In verse 35, these two thieves see all these rulers and people sneering at him and saying, He saved others! Let him save himself if this is the Christ, the Son of God, his chosen one. Through the eyes of a thief, he's seeing this. In verse 37, we see again the soldiers saying, Save yourself! And in verse 38, we see the inscription... This is the king of the Jews. Here he is. This thief that's hanging on side of him is seeing all of these things being manifested. He has eyes to see. The other one doesn't. The one on the right is prepared to die. The one on the left is wanting to save himself. The thief on the left wants to save self. In verse 39, we see the other thief railing on him, shouting out abuses, saying, Save yourself! And us! Wow. But you see, it's not about saving ourselves. It's about dying to self. In verse 40, we see the confession of the other thief that is hanging on the cross. And he says, and confesses, he says, and confesses. Before you can be saved, you have to repent and confess that you're a sinner and need a Savior. You have to be able to confess that Jesus Christ is God. He is the door. He is the only way. Well, let's see what the thief on the right says in verse 40. We see the confession of the thief that is hanging on the cross and he says and confesses does thou not fear God there's the confession Jesus is God you have to realize that here is the realization of this thief that this one that this is the one true God hanging right on side of him and he rebukes the other thief by saying, Do you not fear God? The Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. There's a realization to the thief that's hanging on the cross that this is God. And if he's forgiven them, maybe too, I can be forgiven. In verse 41, we see through the eyes of the thief, he realizes he is a sinner. 
and deserves to die. And he then says, and I quote, the man that is next to him has done nothing wrong. The word says there is none innocent. That's a realization that he is God. He's realizing the man on side of us is innocent. The Bible says there's none innocent. Obviously, he's got a realization that this is God's son. Because he's saying he has no sin. And the Bible clearly says there's none innocent. No, not one. The word says, there is none innocent, no, not one, but yet this thief says he is innocent. Now we see in verse 42, we see a confirmation that Jesus is the King of Kings. And the repentant heart, for he asks Jesus to allow him to be in his kingdom. He first confesses that he is a transgressor of the law and he tells the other thief, are you not, are you still, you know, are you crazy to be railing at God when he is innocent and we deserve to die? Realizing he is a sinner and needs a savior. That's the first thing that comes with preaching the gospel. They have to be pricked in their heart that they're a sinner. That Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And there's no other way to the Father but through him. Thieves go in through windows. But this man found the door. Ah! Did you hear me? No more going through the window. He went to the door. My God is awesome, son. In verse 42, we see the confession that Jesus is the King of Kings. And a repent of heart, he asks Jesus to allow him to be in his kingdom. To be his king. He asks him to be his king and to be a part of his kingdom. Remember me. He wanted to be subjected under that king, under that rule, under that authority. He was asking him, will you be my king? Who is your king? So confession and repentance was made. Repent. Repent and be baptized was the thief on the cross baptized in verse 43 we see our loving king saying truly I say unto you the same thing that has been promised to you and me he says in verse 43 we see our loving king saying truly I say unto you today you will be with me in paradise. Sheol, Abraham's bosom. And what did he do on the feast of release? The Bible says that he went and preached the gospel to the spirits that were held in a prison that Satan had. But Jesus had the keys on the feast of release to release them from the bondage of death and the sting of the grave. Well, baptism means to be buried with him. Now, I ask you, was the thief buried? Yes, he was. And was he with Jesus in Sheol? Yes, he was. Was a thief on the cross baptized. Baptism is taking part in the death and the burial. That thief died and he was buried and with, he was with Jesus. How do we know that? Because Jesus said it. Truly I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. He was buried with him. Now, Jesus' body was buried in a tomb, but his spirit went down the same place 
thief went with him. In verse 43, we see our loving king saying today, truly, you'll be with me in paradise. The Bible says, the Bible says in Joel chapter 2, verse 9, that robbers and thieves use windows. But this, but this used to be thief has now found the door. See, he was a thief. He would go in and steal. He would go in through windows. Even being a thief, this is God's amazing, amazing grace. Judas could have easily been saved. Because Christ forgives thieves too. And he says, he also says, anyone that ever come before me was a robber and a thief. Right? And thieves use windows. And he talks about thieves. If you would have known what time the thief in the night would have come, you would have stayed up and kept guard. Because the thief doesn't use the door, you would have been watching your window. Why? Because they didn't have, you know, window panes like we have today. They would go into that open hole. They needed that open hole there because it's hot there. They needed the airflow. And that's how the thieves would come in. The Bible says that robbers and thieves use windows. But this thief, or this used to be thief, he is no longer a thief. He is born again. Oh, born again. Let's see. But was he baptized? He confessed to Jesus on the cross that he was the Son of God. He was the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he even asked him. And he even said outwardly, I am a sinner and need a Savior. And he was looking at his Savior hanging on the cross. How do we know that? He openly professed with his mouth to the other thief, Do you not fear God? We deserve to die, but this man is innocent. But was he baptized? Baptism means to be buried with Christ. Question. Was, was he buried with him? I think so. In fact, I know so. Did he come up out of the water? What is the water? The grave. Did he come up out of the grave? I think he did. Did he come up out of the water? I think so. I know so. He arose out of the grave with the first fruits of the resurrection of Jesus. I ask again, was a thief on the cross baptized? Yes, he was. I read to you Isaiah chapter 53. I'm going to read to you... Um, John chapter 10. I'm just about done. John chapter 10. He says in John chapter 10, verse 1, Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who does not enter in by the door unto the fold of the sheep, but climbs up any some other way, he is a thief and a robber. This was this man's life. That's our life. Was our life. But he who has entered in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. You see? That thief heard his voice. And the Lord said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Who opened the door? Well, who had the keys? <laughs> well, who opened the door? Well, who had the keys? Because no, Satan didn't go down there and open the door. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He was let out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what, thing, what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. 
And if anyone enters through me, that thief entered in now through the door, he will be saved. He was saved. And will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Amen. Wow. I ask you again. Was the thief on the cross baptized? How many believe in here the, she the, the thief on the cross was baptized? Let me see your hands. How many of you believe? He was baptized. You better believe he was baptized. He was baptized in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died with him. He believed and had faith. He fell under the old covenant but was baptized. John preached the gospel of repentance. He found repentance on the cross. He goes into Sheol and he hears the gospel preached to him. How do we know that? Well, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, Cursed is any man who hangs from a tree. Amen. That's the law. You see, Jesus Christ was innocent. And that tree couldn't hold him. It had nothing on him. Gleaning through the Word of God to find fault in that perfect lamb as he's hanging on it, it pleased God to examine him. <clears throat> or should I say, to allow Lucifer to examine him. Here he is. Here's what you examine him with. Find fault. And you can keep your keys but if you don't you have to release them on the feast of release that's why the grave has no more sting there's no more power in the grave through Jesus Christ why because just as that thief was raised from the dead, so you and I, in Titus 2.13, have the same blessed hope. Amen. Though we be planted with Him, we also too will be raised with Him. Amen. That is the good news. That is the gospel. Amen. That God has a place prepared for you and me. No more Sheol. No more purgatory, so-called. To be absent from the body now, Paul said, is to be present with our Lord. Amen. If you wake up in the wrong place, ain't nobody coming for you. You better, you better, you better be buried with Him. Your life, yourself, better be dead and planted so that you can bring forth fruit. We're in a time of sowing seed. And if I could say one thing to you, more important than anything, is sow you. Sow you. Sow your seed. Die. Because if you don't die now, you're going to die later. Amen. Amen. And if you seek to save your life now, you're going to lose it later. If you're doing things you're not supposed to be doing, stop! So that you can bring forth fruit. Die to self. Do you really believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Well, plant yourself with Him. If you say you believe He's the Messiah and you don't plant your life with Him die with Him to do His will, you're not dead. And you're not producing nothing. Amen. And any tree that does not produce fruit will be hewed down, cut down by the axe head and cast into the fire. You want to know what it's about right now? It's about you and I sowing ourselves. 
about dying to self. Amen. So that others, as Christ died, that thief lived. And we have been given the ministry of reconciliation to go forth as ministers for Him. Have you told somebody about Jesus? Yeah. Is that your life? I'm in love with the man. <laughs> the man I'm in love with is Jesus Christ. And I'm giving you seed. But before you can use this seed, you have to sow your seed. You have to sow your seed. You have to die. The ministry came forth in my life when the Lord called me. First thing, this right here is a coffin. My first dream He ever gave me. He told me, choose it. I realized it this morning. If I wouldn't have chose that coffin in that dream and hung it around my neck like a yoke to remind me that I need to be dead with Him, planted with Him every day, I wouldn't produce any fruit. So the first dream He gives me and, and all of the jewels and rubies and sapphires I told you about that fell out the wall, he told me, choose the coffin that was hanging on the, jo the gold chain. Because he, he was telling me that I needed to die. Before what's going to come after, before anything happens, you have to die. You cannot continue in sin. You can't. You have to die to the desires of the flesh. Amen. So that you can be fruitful so that you can be pruned to bear more. Until you realize this realization, why waste your life when you could just lose it? Just lose it. Lose it for Him. So that you can gain the world. Not gain not the world itself, but the people that are in the world. They're looking for something. The thief was seeing something through the eyes of a thief. He saw something and desired it and wanted it and longed for it and had to have it and believed God. Have you had that experience? Have you had that encounter? Because let me tell you something. When you've had that experience, you'll sell out. was a thief on the cross baptized. The true the tree represents the law and the curse of the law to a sinner is death. But a man with no sin, the curse of the tree could not hold on to him. Jesus subjected himself to this tree for you and me. You want to live by the law? You in trouble. You are in trouble. The Bible says in Galatians the law is bondage. I'm talking about trying to fulfill the law. Why fulfill the law when it's already been fulfilled to the top it has been filled up and only one man could do it but through Jesus Christ we still try to keep it he didn't throw it away we still we can't commit adultery or fornicate we can't you know we have to love the Lord thy God with all our heart mind body soul and strength love our neighbor as ourself honor thy father and mother which means to take care of them when they're old we can't steal, cheat, be a drunkard, be a glutton. We can't do these things because these things are not becoming unto the Lord. And when you do these things, you stun your growth. You hinder your fruit. You got two different kind of fruit hanging on your tree. And they ask you like they used to ask me when I was young coming up in the Lord. Are you saved this week or are you not? 
What do you produce on your tree? It says, and I'm done. The tree represents the law and the curse of the law. To a sinner is death. But a man who had no sin, the curse uh, can't hold him. Jesus subjected himself to the tree for you and me. He is greater than this tree. Wow. One greater is here now. Wow. Because the law brings condemnation. Well, Jesus came to save, to seek and save that which was lost. But the law is good, precious, and holy, and we need it. It shows us that we're a sinner. But once you realize you're a sinner, and you really, truly receive Jesus Christ, well, you don't have to have that law ruling over you because all you want to do now is please Him. Therefore, He is greater than this tree and has been given power to release anyone who is under the curse of the tree. Everybody who has not received Jesus Christ is under the curse. That's why Lucifer was in that tree. And because Eve ate from it, now the ground's curse and thorn and thistle. You're going to find out that that tree is going to stick you. I get in the other tree. As the thief believed on him and was set free, so you and I. So you and I, if we seek to save our life, we'll lose it as the thief did. But if we believe and die with him, we will be raised up with him on the feast of release. The feast of first fruits. Passover. First seven days, Jesus rose on the third day, the feast of first fruits. The, the, the thief arose with him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the thief that died on the cross? It says, when they arose from the ground, well, he hadn't been, he hadn't even seen, this thief hadn't even seen corruption yet. Because it's only the third day. On the fourth day, you see corruption. This thief they nailed on the cross became a testimony for Jesus Christ because he was walking around in Jerusalem. Aren't you the thief on the cross? Yeah! Ah! Ah! Yes, indeed! Wait! I saw them nail you to the cross. I saw them break your legs with bats. Man, you're looking good. <laughs> what? what happened? Man, it was God. Well, where's the other thief? He's in hell. Because he didn't plan himself. Boy, I love it when the Lord just... But if we believe and we die with him, we too will be raised up. As this thief was raised up in the Feast of First Fruits. In Titus 2.13 it says, 11 through 13. I'm going to read it and I'm done. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. That means no matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. He loves you. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. And all you have to do, I mean, think about this. All that thief had to do was believe that he was God. That's all he did. He believed that the man that was hanging next to him was God. And he confessed that he was a sinner. And because he realized that Jesus Christ was God. He also too was set free. And you too can be set free. No matter what you've done, where you've been. But you have to believe. You have to die to self. It's really simple. Because we have a hope in us. Titus 2.13 We're looking for the blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5 about the Lord's return and our gathering together unto Him. That's what the blessed hope is. That is the feast of release. That is the resurrection of the dead. That He's coming back. Though we die now, we know that we'll be raised up with Him. But if you don't confess and truly mean it and have true repentance in your heart you'll be like the other thief and all you do is when times get hard and things get bad you'll rail on him and you'll say things like you know I'm cursed or you know all of this is happening because of God God's doing this God ain't doing none of it So now's the time to sow yourself, to die to self. And you know the Lord's been after you for a long time. This is the time. Now is the time. That's why Jesus couldn't die in the winter. You don't plant in the winter. That's why when the Lord returns, I believe He's going to return in the springtime. So Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, you are so amazing. And as you know, the scripture came forward today. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me, says the Lord, and I will show you the hidden things. Lord, this was definitely hidden from me. Was the thief on the cross baptized? I say today, yes, he was. So my question is to you. Have you been baptized? Have you been baptized? Have you been planted in him, in his death, in his burial? And I'm not simply talking about a dip in the water and coming up and saying, oh yeah, I got in the, you know, I was baptized in this creek or in this tub or whatever. No. Did you truly, in your heart, mean it? Did you really die to self? Because if you didn't die to self, well, you're a robber and a thief. And you think you're going to get into heaven through a window when you have to pass through the door. And the door knows if you are dead or not, if you planted yourself. So Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I ask that each and every one of us today would be just uh, reminded of the time that we're in. The feast of releases is, is coming upon us. Lord, that you would release, um, Father, that you would begin to release others that are held in bondage, Father, through the curse of the law, that their eyes would be open, their ears would be open, Father, to see you, Lord, prune us and use us help us plant ourselves father so we can be fruitful for you and Lord I want to be a part of your kingdom you are my king remember me and your kingdom father in Jesus name amen amen and amen yes indeed God's awesome, huh? God is amazing. Thank you, Father, for your love.